Hey everybody, welcome back to Lawyer Ramen. This is Ryan here. This is the face behind the camera, the guy that does all the cooking. I just wanted to come on and say thank you guys so much. We just passed 60,000 subscribers, which is crazy because we started the year with 6,000 subscribers and that was crazy because we started December with like 1,000 subscribers. So it's been crazy. Uh, I just wanted to come on and say thanks and do a quick Q&A. Not that my answers are anything special or anything. I just wanted to say thank you in person. Anyways, I got a bunch of questions from you guys here that you guys submitted on Instagram and on YouTube. Just gonna read through them and do the best that I can to answer some of them. So. Okay, let's get started. So the first question uh, that I got a lot of is why did I get started making ramen? And so uh, it's not really a complicated story and I think it's a story that I think most people that get into ramen have one or two stories. One, they have like a really great experience or a really bad experience and those are the two things that get people started. So there's a local ramen shop that opened up here where I live and I went to it very excited and I was incredibly dis disappointed with the quality of ramen there. And so I came home and I thought, hey, I could do this on my own. I could do better. And my first bowl of ramen was terrible, which kind of led me into this rabbit hole of trying to figure out how to do this better. And that's what I've been doing for the last two or three years now. So yeah, not very complicated story. I think it's a pretty common story, but that's how I got started making ramen. Uh, what was my first bowl of ramen like? So it was terrible. Um, the first time I tried to make ramen, I made a tonkotsu ramen. And I think I just went online, I kind of searched for some recipes and stuff, and I didn't really know what I was doing. And I bought some saimen noodles, which were terrible. And I had, I didn't know how to make a tare, so it was very undersalted. So the soup itself just tasted like a bland pork water soup, and it was bad. The, the, the lucky thing was I saved the soup and I actually made tsukemen later with a really salty tare, like I redid the tare and that turned out really well. So that was kind of like, after initial failure, some validation and that's what kind of helped me keep going. But my first bowls were bad. Everybody's first bowls are bad according to what I've been hearing on my podcast. So if your first bowls are bad, don't feel too bad about that. Everybody sucks in the beginning. So what inspired you to create this YouTube channel? So when I first started making ramen at home, I initially started searching in English for recipes and tips and things, and there really wasn't much out there. And I, um, I think I think I might have stumbled on Ramen Lord's things, but other than that, I couldn't really find anything. And the videos that I saw on YouTube were all, I wouldn't say they were wrong, but they were not the way to make ramen that people make ramen in Japan. And at that point, I had been studying Japanese on my own for maybe about three years. And so I started searching for recipes in Japanese instead of English. And I noticed there was a huge difference in terms of the methods that people in Japan were using versus the methods that were being shown on YouTube in America to make ramen. So I just wanted to kind of bridge the gap and bring over some of the Japanese recipes to English. And that's kind of why I started the channel. And also I was super depressed. I was in a bad place in my life and I needed to do something creative. And this was kind of like my escape a little bit at that point in time. If you didn't do way of ramen, what other food could it have been? So actually, this is kind of interesting. I actually didn't intend to do a ramen cooking channel in the beginning. I wanted to do a super simple recipe channel, which I kind of do on the way of ramen a lot. But um, for people that don't know, if you go to Japan, you eat food there, the food is phenomenal. Um, but for most of the people that live in Japan and work in Japan, they work all day, they come home tired, they just want to eat something quick, go to sleep, and wake up a more, uh, the next morning to go back to work. So if you look at a lot of the recipes in Japanese online, there are a lot of them are 10 minutes or less, 30 minutes or less recipes. And it was gonna be a channel geared to someone like my brother who also works a lot and doesn't cook too much. And a lot of these 10 minute recipes in Japanese that are, they're really good for the amount of effort that's required. And so my original idea was to do a channel that was focused on that kind of cooking, like 10 minute cooking, cook, basically cooking for like college kids or recent college grads or people that just don't have too much time for cooking but just need to eat something quick so they can go back to sleep. And I might still do that in the future, we'll see. I still I think still think the idea is pretty cool, so. How much have you improved at making ramen from when you started the channel? Oh, tons. Uh, when I first started the channel, I basically was just starting. I basically only tried to make tonkotsu ramen up until that point. And I felt my tonkotsu ramen had gotten not bad, but it still wasn't phenomenal. Uh, but from doing the research for videos on this channel and also interviewing all these people on the podcast, the Way of Ramen podcast, I've learned a ton from all of these people that know so much more than me. And I feel like um, I'm just now starting to kind of get a grasp of what makes ramen taste good and 
how to make my own style of ramen is kind of starting to develop just now. So I feel like I'm still a very much so a beginner, but I'm way better than I was when I started the channel. It's kind of like, um, I talk about a lot, a lot the Dunning-Kruger effect where you're, when you're a beginner, you feel like you know a lot. So you kind of, your confidence shoots up, but as you learn more and more, your confidence kind of goes down because you realize how much more everybody around you knows. And I'm kind of like at the bottom of that curve now, but I'm also cognizant of the fact that the Dunning-Kruger effect is real. So I feel like I don't know anything, but I also know that I've been doing it long enough where I probably know more than people that are just starting. But it's improved a ton, and uh, that was a great question. What's Hawaii like? Hawaii is awesome. I grew up here on the island of Kauai. I'm still here on the island of Kauai. I went away to college in Oregon for four years, and I lived on Oahu, which is the main island for four years. And no place has been like home to me. The people here on Kauai are super friendly. The air is clean, the nature is beautiful. We're called the Garden Island for a reason. Everything's green around here. And uh, my family's here, I love it. But ironically, I don't spend too much time outdoors at the beach. I spend a lot of time indoors on my computer, either working or playing on my iPad. So, kind of a waste. How are you doing in the lockdown? I'm doing not bad, it's pretty good. Uh, we have a really great mayor here and he was very proactive in terms of shutting down the island. So we have the fewest amount of cases out of any island in Hawaii. And so that's great. I think we only have four active cases now and they're all in isolation. Uh, the only challenging thing has been that my kid has been home all day and I love him, but he doesn't understand what working on a computer looks like because to him, it just looks like I'm watching YouTube videos all day long, which is kind of what it looks like when someone's editing videos and doing other things. But yeah, it's, it's going pretty good. I think we kind of got a little closer too. So lockdown's been not bad. What is your occupation? What is my job? So this is uh, kind of a weird thing. Uh, for the last 12 years, I've run a business called Ukulele Underground with my two friends. Uh, we teach people how to play the ukulele on the internet. Basically, it's kind of like a, like a, one of these course things, but not really. It's more like a Netflix for people that want to learn how to play ukulele. We started it when we were all in our early 20s. And uh, we basically built this business from $300 to like a pretty good size small business, you know, like we have people that work there at the company and uh, yeah, it's been a great ride and a great thing and we're still friends and I love those guys. Uh, but honestly, the reason I've been spending a lot of time making Way of Ramen videos because it's what I feel the most passionate about and I'm having the most fun doing this. So we'll see what the future has, but that's currently my job. I still work at Ukulele on the ground and I still do a lot of things there. How did I learn Japanese? Oh, so that's an interesting thing. So I I started studying Japanese about five or six years ago, right when my son was born. My son's gonna be six next week. So just about five and a half years. Uh, I, I had this really weird eye disease thing and I thought I was gonna go blind. So learning Japanese was always on my bucket list. I'm a fourth generation Japanese American who grew up in Hawaii, which means I didn't know any Japanese prior. I went to Japanese school, but like most Japanese in Hawaii, I didn't learn anything. He went to Japanese school, but and when I was little, I went to Japanese school. But I, I never learned nothing. Because I wasn't interested in it. So five and a half years ago, I started studying because I thought I was going to go blind. And I just basically from morning to night did everything I could to learn Japanese as quickly as possible before I couldn't read books anymore. So I bought a bunch of books and I watched a bunch of videos online. I watched a lot of Japanese from Zero's material. Uh, George Trombley, shout out to him. He was also inspiration for starting this channel because uh, I like people like him. But uh, I did a lot of research on how polyglots learn languages and I kind of found out that how people learn languages most effectively is through mass immersion. So I did, I would just watch Japanese YouTubers from morning to night. Hikakin was my Japanese father, even though he's younger than me. And I would just listen to him over and over and over again and try to like decipher these sentences and over time, uh, it kind of got easier to understand the language, and then I studied kanji. I have a kanji book back there. I learned all the joyo kanji for reading a newspaper in Japanese, and I forgot half of them by now. But um, yeah, it's just been a process. I'm still learning, but uh, basically, if you want to learn Japanese, just um, find things that you like to do in normally, and just find the Japanese equivalent of that, and just start immersing yourself in that, whether it's like videos, video games, cooking, whatever it is, just try to immerse as much as possible with that material and then you'll just build like a little pocket of fluency in that area, which you can expand later if you want to, or if you don't want to expand it, that's cool too. It just takes a long time. And so don't get discouraged if you're not making any progress in the beginning. 
How do you incorporate ramen making into your schedule? What does your fridge look like? My fridge, I think, is pretty good. Like, my wife complains about it all the time, but I think I'm doing a pretty good job keeping it to a minimum. It's filled with tares and shoyus and oils and things like that in the fridge. And in the freezer, I have noodles and bones and chicken and pork and chash. Okay, well, I'm not maybe not doing such a great job, but I think it's still not taking up the majority of the fridge yet. So I'm kind of winning in that sense, I guess. What is the best ramen you ever had and where did they serve it to you unless it's your own? So this is a interesting thing because unlike a lot of people that get into making ramen, I actually haven't eaten too much ramen in my life. Um, I got into making ramen after I had my kid and since I had my kid, I haven't really been able to travel too much. I've gone to Japan once since he's been born and I think I ate ramen there once the entire time I was there because I just wasn't into making ramen at the time. I was more into studying Japanese at that point in my life. Yeah, and, and so the best ramen I ever had, I don't really know. Maybe Ipudo, the first time I tried it, was something so different. I remember being blown away by that, but other than that, I'm pretty disappointing, I think. What other Japanese foods do I like? I like a lot of Japanese foods. I like pretty much all Japanese food, actually. I, I think if I were to say my favorite Japanese food of all time, it's mentaiko onigiri. That's like probably my top from 7-Eleven or from Family Mart. I think that's one of my top things. But other than that, like everything, yakitori, sushi, katsu, tonkatsu, Japanese curry, pretty much everything. Okonomiyaki, takoyaki, everything. What is your favorite food that isn't ramen, favorite cuisine that isn't Japanese? My favorite cuisine that isn't Japanese, probably Filipino or Chinese food, but uh, I like more like the party food. So I, I have a hard time eating the dinaguan, kind of like the blood meats and the intestines and things, but I like the stuff that they serve at Filipino parties, which I performed at a lot when I was a musician. Uh, what is your go-to lazy ramen or instant ramen? So. My go-to lazy ramen is I use uh, like a, ch a Chinese or Japanese chicken stock powder and then just use the tares and the oils that I have for making real ramen and the noodles and the toppings. So it's basically all real ramen things that I prepped in advance and just store in the fridge or freezer. And then I just don't make soup. I just use instant soup. And I'm still experimenting with that. And I think I can get it to the point where it's like 85 to 90% as good as, maybe not 90, 85% as good as a soup made from scratch, but that's my go-to quick ramen. Ramen basics and tools. So the basics of ramen is pretty simple. For as far as tools, first of all, you basically just need two pots to boil, one pot to boil soup and one pot to boil your noodles. And then as, as you go from there, you can pick up more things like a kitchen scale is probably the most important thing to have if you're gonna get really serious into making ramen because you're gonna need that to make noodles and weigh out ingredients for tares and other things. A bunch of the special uh, special sized ladles, that helps a lot if you're gonna be serving a lot of people because you can just know that that's 300 mils or 15 mils or 20 mils, 25 mils. You can get those, those are pretty cool. A sous vide machine or pasta machine to cut noodles. Th those are all really cool things, but the basic things you just need is two pots to boil soup and then one to boil your noodles and a strainer. Um, as far as the uh, basics of making ramen, you you have two soups types, the chintan, which is a clear soup stock, and the python, which is like your cloudy soups, thick viscous soup. So chintans, you basically want to keep it from, while you're cooking it, you don't want it to boil. So 175 to 190, somewhere in between there, maybe like 180, 185, something around that range the whole time you're cooking that. And pythons, you just let it rip and let it boil as much as possible. Keep topping it off with water. And and tares should be saltier than you think should they should be, basically. And then just taste it. Make stuff that you think tastes good. Oh, and also be sure to add aroma oils, because I think that's the one ingredient that most people who are making ramen for the first time forget or don't know about. You have to have some kind of added fat component to make it taste good. So I have a lot of videos on my channel. Just check those out, and those are good for beginners. All right. Is there any must-see videos or must-read books for an aspiring ramen chef or ramen home cook? Yes, uh, I would say go to Reddit and read all of Ramen Lord's guides because as far as people outside of Japan, I think Mike is probably the best resource for of knowledge of ramen. He's, he's a ramen lord for a reason. I think out of everybody in America, he deserves the most respect when it comes to making ramen. Um, as far as like what he's done to help other people who are getting up and running for home cooks. And so check out his stuff on Reddit. 
I want to start making my own noodles because I'm a ramen addict. I love to see a, a video of the tools you use and ingredients that work well. So I have a video on how to make uh, noodles. It's the one, it's titled weird because I was a little afraid that I put too much whole wheat in it. So I titled it something like trying out whole wheat in ramen noodles. But that's a pretty good primer video if you're trying to get into making noodles. The only thing I would suggest to change for that video is to up, up your hydration to like 40%. As far as tools you need, kitchen scale, a big mixing bowl, and a noodle pasta machine. So if you have those three things and you watch that video, you should be set because it has all the ingredients you need to make your first batch of noodles. Best way to save fresh noodles for later. If you can store them in like a Tupperware container or a box, something that has like pretty rigid uh, corners and uh, walls, you can stick it into the freezer and defrost that and it will prevent, by putting it into a box, it will prevent it from breaking if something hits it. So that's a pretty good way. That's how I've been saving my noodles recently. Uh, tare and aroma oil shelf life. So basically the tare is so salty, you can pretty much keep it indefinitely in the fridge. And I have some tare that's months old and I still use it from time to time. And I think it's fine. It's If, it, if it's that salty and it's in the fridge, it's probably gonna have a hard time growing any kind of bacteria or mold or anything. And oils, I just try not to make too much aroma oil. Uh, I just make enough for uh, how much people I'm serving and if there's leftover I save it in the fridge and just use it until it's gone But I don't think that one lasts as long as the tatties. Is. is there a way to store? Uh, broth or soup for ramen in the freezer. Yes, you can store your soup in the freezer But some people will say that the flavor gets gets kind of uh, Diminished when the longer you store it in the freezer because of the cells get broken down and stuff I'm not sure I'm not a scientist, but that's what I've heard I do that I always store it in the freezer and I use that to make ramen all the time and I think it's not bad so should I always use hon mirin when mirin is called for in a recipe? Basically, when people, rest Japanese recipes call for mirin, they're talking about hon mirin, which is uh, sweet cooking wine. It actually has alcohol in it, but it's really hard to get outside of Japan. So just use whatever you get. The whole point of using mirin is to add sweetness into the something. So even if you just have honey or sugar or something, you're kind of doing the same thing. It's the same idea. And uh, the stuff that you get in America is usually mirin fu, seasoning or meat uh, meat in and those things are basically just corn syrup and so yeah i mean honestly i'm not my palate's not sophisticated enough to tell the difference when you use it even though if i taste it separately they taste way different the final products are mm, negligible to me of course there's probably going to be people in the comments yelling at me that it's way different but simplest but most underrated ramen after new wave tokyo so uh, i think the most underrated ramen is ramen that you make for yourself that is, uh, represents who you are and what kind of flavors you want to bring out. I think too many people are chasing uh, flavors that they tasted in Japan, which is not a bad thing. I think it's great to strive for things and know what you're shooting for. But I also feel that people should try to express themselves in their bowls of ramen when they're making ramen because it's one of the most expressive types of foods you can make in terms of how customized you can make it to be something that represents you. So I think the most underrated bowls that people are making are the ones that represent themselves the best. And lastly, what do you think has been the most exciting part of this journey? And this whole ramen journey thing has been unbelievable. I mean, I like I said earlier, I started making ramen to kind of distract myself from, you know, just feeling down. I don't, I don't want to use the word depressed, but I was pretty close, I think, to fitting the description of that just didn't feel the need to get up in the morning and making ramen was so like uh, something that kind of just got me out of that funk and as far as cool things that has been part of this like meeting like ramen lord whose recipes I would read on reddit and kind of getting to know him that's been a high point uh, YouTube putting me as creator on the rise for a day that was ridiculous you know like um, I'm doing a collab with this youtuber soon you guys keep on my lookout for that uh, I was watching his videos from before I started this YouTube channel, so it's crazy. I mean, like, there's been so many things, but there is a... Something here. I, I keep a... This is not really a journal, because I don't really write in it a lot, but I once in a while, I'll write things in here. And I have... I write it in Japanese, so my wife can't understand what it says. But um, I wrote something in... The, this was October 28th, 2019. And it basically... I wrote about how I got a thousand subscribers on my YouTube channel, and... I was just so blown away by that. And I still remember what that felt like, just reading through this and what was going through my mind. And uh, yeah, so I think the most exciting part of this journey so far has been just even getting that. And all this since then has been just 
gravy and I'm just incredibly thankful and appreciative of everybody who's been watching these videos and kind of sticking around, engaging with me on Instagram and on the Discord channel, listening to the podcast. I just wanted to say thank you guys all so much. I mean, you guys have changed my life and it's been incredible and I really just hope to keep doing this for as long as you guys are interested. So thank you guys all so much and I'll see you all in the next video.